Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, a family podcast of pirates and penguins. We're a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston. Join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. So uh, I do have a little bit of listener feedback. <clears throat> Last week we were talking, we didn't know what PSR stood for in relation to uh, religious education and religious formation. And a helpful listener wrote in, Michael, wrote in on our Facebook page to tell us that PSR stands for Parish School of Religion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I think it's a, like a hyper-regional term, I, I think, uh, like like maybe like Maryland or Baltimore or something like that. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't look it up. But uh, I feel like I've seen more people than just Maryland people okay. using it. But Yeah, I think it's a very specific thing. But uh, yeah, interesting. Parish School of Religion. Right. So that's that. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, I'll give an update on how my finger's doing after my cleaver incident last week. And uh, it's it's doing much better. So it's a week on. And I finally moved down to having just one Band-Aid. I have to say, it hurts more now than it did then. Apart from the getting it taken care of. But like the next day, it didn't hurt that much. It hurts now. And I think it's just the sign of healing, you know, as things knit themselves together again. Gosh, I, I wish I was like those superheroes where they heal as you watch them on screen, like, you know, but no, now I'm old. I have like an anti anti superpower. <laughs> as you get older, you heal slower. Uh, so and uh, as as you've attested, every once in a while, like jam it against something and it hurts like the dickens. I can usually refrain from like yelling out when I hurt when I stub a toe or you smack a finger. I'll do like fake Bill Cosby swearing rasa raka raka fucking mug mug raka raka you know but uh, uh -huh. but with this one oh i can't i can't contain myself i yell <laughs> ah so why does thing why do why do we say that things hurt like the dickens what is the dickens <laughs> like charles dickens <laughs> charles dickens that jerk <laughs> He was he was known to be painful on people. I don't know, like the well, we don't want to say the devil. It's like a, it's a, an over scrupulosity thing about about talking about attributing things to the devil. It hurts, you know. We'd say it hurts like heck or hell or it hurts like the devil. But uh, what, yeah, what is? Here's the Google. What's the Dickens? Now we're gonna look this up. The Dickens. What is the Dickens? Uh, so. The Dickens. Definition of the Dickens by Marion Webster. <laughs> the Dickens. <laughs> the Dickens. Uh, it's the devil. It's It frightened, it scared the Dickens out of me. <laughs> She's cute as the Dickens. These are the sample senses. I, what the Dickens do you mean? Um, and I've never heard those particular expressions. It's just informal, old-fashioned, used to make a statement or question more forceful. That's it. <laughs> it's just a there you go. more forcefulness. <laughs> Uh, that doesn't that's not very helpful i suppose it's like the new england intensifier wicked no that makes sense no it doesn't <laughs> hey that is wicked awesome so you let it okay go. my my favorite example though was mother Teresa was wicked, wicked holy. holy wicked holy <laughs> anybody from this area of, of of the world would know exactly what you're talking about would not yeah, think twice that, about it that that was a said by a ch child in the uh a teenager in the uh, youth, youth group. group. Yeah, she was wicked holy. Yeah, she was. Nobody but you like did bad at actually, an eye. Actually, that. that was that was um, 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 uh, my roommate Megan Walburn. Actually, was the one who reported right, that right. One to me. Nobody but Megan batted an eye at that. <laughs> All right, so that's the finger. Okay, so uh, <laughs> you've now given everybody <laughs> given the finger. Everybody. The finger, yes. <laughs> the finger update. So what's been going on? On uh, Monday, uh, no, Tuesday. Tuesday? <laughs> Skip ahead, my brother Maynard. <laughs> Money Python reference. Uh, on Tuesday, we had the girls had their scout meeting. And instead of going to hang out in a room with masks on again, 
like we've been doing a lot of, the Scoutmaster, Chris, said, let's go fishing. So we all went down to Lake Holbrook, and we I brought my fishing rods. And <laughs> Which is really more of a pond, right? No, it's a lake. A pond, it doesn't have inflo- uh, visible inflows and outflows, or at least outflows, whereas a lake does. I thought it was about depth and size. Oh, I think that's one of those things where the, the definition varies depending on who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. There are there are lakes called there are ponds that are called lake and lakes that are called pond and waters yeah. that are called waters and the broads and the things like that. I'm not referring to women. I'm like there's a place in England called the Norfolk Broads, which is a whole waterway area. Anyway, whole nother thing. We went fishing. You went fishing. <laughs> Start digging. So we went fishing. Uh, brought my fishing rods, my tackle box. Uh, Sophie broke my rod. <laughs> It's, there's a there's a little nut that holds the uh, the handle onto the reel, and I don't know what it is about these kids, but they're constantly knocking the nut off, and and I've got to like got buy replacement nuts, and um, then Bella, I lent her my flashlight because we we got there by the by the time we were done, it was dark, it was like dark dark, and I lent her my pocket flashlight that I always carry around with me, and she's like, and I like the next day I'm like, oh, Bella, I need my flashlight back. She's like, I, what flashlight? <laughs> The one I lent you, I don't have it. Ah, where is my flashlight? My new flashlight's coming from Amazon tomorrow. So we went fishing, and uh, so Bella really, I've taken the kids fishing, but Bella really hasn't done much fishing. She gets up there, Chris puts the, the, the scoutmaster puts the worm on the hook. She goes out there, casts, bam, she gets a fish. <laughs> it's the first fish she ever caught. First cast, first fish. Reels it in, uh, lets it go, casts again, a few minutes go by, bam, she gets a perch. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? She's like, it's like Bella with the animals. And then she goes to release it, right? She puts it in the water, and it's like, sits here for a second, and it swims and goes, bam, right into a rock. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Uh, and then she caught a third fish. So she got three fish right off the bat. It was really wild. Sophie did not catch any fish, but that might partly be because she broke my rod, my reel, uh, very early. But uh, but no, they had fun, and uh, a couple of the other girls caught some fish, and it was getting dark, and uh, we we kind of packed it in because uh, we couldn't see what we were doing after a while. But it was it was it was nice. I didn't do any fishing. I one of the things with when fishing, I found fishing with the kids is I don't get to fish. I run between the five of them, untangling things. You only had two of them, though. Yeah, and they were being taken up by the scoutmaster, but I only brought the two rods. Like I didn't, I didn't bring a rod for me because, because you assumed I assumed that, you that I'd be able to fish. Yeah, I could have brought a rod, I suppose. But uh, but I do want to. I, I want to uh, go take the kids out again. They're getting old enough now where I'm going to start to you know leave it up to them to untangle their mess, <laughs> or at least some of them. Uh, the the scouts should be able to untangle their own messes. Right, right. The cubs, maybe not so much. Yeah. But. So next week, we're going to go, um, I'm taking my Cub Scout den to uh, a place nearby where Dan thinks it might be a really good place to do a fishing derby. So uh, we'll have to check that out. That'll be nice. So it's supposed to be really good for fishing. So that was that. So the, the we did fishing with the girls. Fishing. Uh, the other thing we did this week, the big thing, was we both got our second vaccine shots. Yes. On Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon. We had our second uh, date in a month. Although, actually, on, on Thursday morning, uh-huh. I, I took the kids for a hike. You didn't go Right. On. Let's talk about that first before we talk about the vaccine shot. I get things out of order. Yeah. Yeah, I was working, but you took the, we, the kids we went out. To, we went to Osprey Overlook, where we, we actually went about the same time last year, um, which is a really nice little park in Weymouth uh, where there are osprey nests. Uh, it's it's at the mouth of the river, which I can't remember the name of the river. Way? It's not the way <laughs> you would think. No, you would think in Weymouth, the mouth of the river would be is, the river the, Way. Well, the, the town was is named Is it the back, back river or the four river? There are two rivers. I think it's the back river. <laughs> which, it's, it's just as funny, actually, because they have two rivers, the back river and the four river. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway... It's it's sort of in the tidal estuary area where you could the river was actually flowing backwards as the tide was was coming in while we were there. Uh-huh. Uh huh. We saw several ospreys. Actually, we saw about eight of them all whirling and heading out towards the sea. 
So we didn't actually get to see them from up close. Right. Um, and we saw some other birds and the, the kids ran around and climbed over rocks and jumped on trees and threw stones. Bella couldn't go either because she had her biology class. Yeah, Bella was on her Zoom biology class, but the rest of them went. And yeah. I think Sophie did not go last year, so it was her first time to go. Uh, it was fun. It was a nice outing. I just love by the end of it. I yeah. was getting frantic texts from you saying, don't forget, we have our appointment this afternoon. <laughs> yes, it was. I was getting getting worried that you would forget. I, I had not forgotten. Yes. Well, I, I love the fact that this time of year where you could we could start to get out. And one of the things you and I were talking about is how many trails and parks and other stuff are like there's like dozens of them within the three towns surrounding us. There's so many places to go. Uh, in fact, I signed up for alltrails.com, which is, it's got an app too, which is sort of like, I kind of compare it to like Yelp for hiking. And it has like a guide, to like to all these trails and it rates them. It tells you how long they are. It gives you maps and all this other stuff. And there's so many awesome trails around us. I just love the fact that this time of year now, it's starting to be nice enough to, to really get out there and enjoy that thing. I, I want to go back to Daniel Webster like we did last year. And, and not yet too hot. And not yet too hot. Right, right, right. That once the full summer hits. Then it can get, although when you if you hike down by the ocean, that's it's it's often not as bad in the in our, the height of the summer. Our kids are wimps when it comes to heat. Like it was sixty four the other day, and the kids are all like, "Oh, it's so hot! I'm dying!" Well, it's it's spring. That's the thing is, is when it's when it's been thirty for four months or it's, below. It, it's not hot. I was wearing. I I I went out and sat in the hammock in the sun. I brought a blanket because it was not hot. You're from Texas. <laughs> yeah, I, I am a Texan and my kids are New Englanders and it's yeah. a very weird mismatched culture thing. Yes, it is. They, they just, they don't even know what heat is. So, uh, so that was Osprey Overlook. You went, th went yes. there and that was good. And uh, so the, the, the shot. So we went over, we had our second date. We went the, the second time in, in a month that you and I had time alone where we went to the... Right. To the place and it was just as efficient as it was last time i love they were so good again you just drive up drive you, drive through you don't get out of the car, don't get out of the car. no waiting it's like the the, the policeman points you to the, to the first guy the you know the first station they they take your cards they check you in you go to the next guy he tells you to bear your arm <laughs> He was, he was giving Melanie a hard time because she wore a long sleeve shirt and like, he's like, how are you going to get your arm out there? <laughs> like, I hope you don't have to take your shirt off. It's like, no, it just, she could lower it. And uh, then we go up to the second part where they, there's two tents and uh, it's, it was very, it was two tents. Uh, that's funny. I was thinking of an old joke. Two tents. Your two tents. Calm down. Uh, there's two tents and they point you into one or the other and the, the paramedics are in there and one goes to Melanie's side and the other one comes to my side. Luckily, you are you get it in the left arm and I got it in the right arm because you're a righty and I'm a lefty. And uh, so they could do us both at once. Other, otherwise, what if, what, one of us would have had to get our shot in our dominant arm. Yes. Um, and, and, I made, and I had Melanie drive so that I could be on the right side. And then you get the shot, and then you move out to the waiting area, and you just sit and wait for 15 minutes, and if you don't have any adverse reaction or grow a third limb, you are able to go. And, was, and that was it. And uh, it was sore, right? So it's the typical getting shot, you know, getting a shot, soreness in the arm. Uh, I... I had a stronger reaction to the right. second shot than you did. Right. So the the by the by the end of that day, we were pretty good. We were, we were doing well. By the end of the day, I was starting to feel a little bit of swollen lymph nodes. That kind of yep. like I'm starting to get sick. My my throat feels swollen. Feeling, I felt some achiness. Like my arm was pretty sore, and I had some other aches, like body aches. But other than that, some ibuprofen, I was fine. But yeah, by the next day, by the next day at noon, I was like. I am not feeling good. I am achy. Full blown fever, aches, chills. Yeah, I, I spent the afternoon uh sleeping, aching, feverish. I think I got up to like a hundred and two. Um but then it was mostly over by like ten or eleven PM. Then it came back a little bit the next day, like I was still kinda tired all day on Saturday. I didn't do anything except scroll facebook all day long <laughs> i mean i really i did not pick up a. I was too tired to pick up a book or watch anything i i i literally like spent most of the day chatting on facebook with friends like 
like not just scrolling, but like actually having conversations. But and I don't know what all my other fr- what my friends were doing with their day that they were like free to chat on <laughs> Facebook all day. But but you um, were recovering. And and then like Saturday night, I started to have a very low grade fever again and feel kind of achy. And and then that was it. Like today I was fine. Yeah, it's really weird how when you're sick, like is especially after the the hump you know after you're on the other side of the worst worst part of the beginning of the, of sickness like you wake up in the morning you feel kind of oh then the day goes on and you're like oh i feel better oh i'm getting better i feel good oh yeah and by by dinner you're like oh yeah i'm feeling pretty good today and then by by like after dinner into the night and get as you get closer to bedtime you're like oh i feel terrible it's like this, it's like this weird wave of of rebound yeah it's like you get that energy and you feel good in the middle of the day but as the night comes on you're like well it's just the, it's really weird i've been hearing and i think your mom uh, confirmed this for her experience that women are getting the side effect of the vaccine much stronger than men in general. I've heard all some men say, Oh yeah. I got... I've, I've heard some guys who, who yeah. had pretty bad reactions. Yeah. They had fevers and stuff like that. But, yeah. but in general, I think I hear more women having an adverse reaction to the second shot than the men, which is interesting given that in general, men are having worse reactions to the virus than women um, in general. So I'm just happy. I, I'm, I'm very happy it's over with and definitely uh, two days of relatively minor feeling bad. It's yeah. Definitely better than actually having COVID. Now, here's an interesting question: When it comes time for kids to get the vaccine, do they do we get them all vaccinated the same day? <laughs> yeah, just get it all over with. Just like, but what if they're all sick after one month? No, <laughs> I, I've I've had, we've I remember those days of when they're all sick at once and running around between them. They're unpleasant. Yeah, but it, but it's not like a ma- ma- major sickness. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean there was no there was no um unpleasant stomach stuff although my sister had some stomach stuff after her your sister job, has she, she is, is is a test case for medical mysteries so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Teresa, uh, uh, Teresa knows this she's she, she will tell you that uh, no no she she literally has this a team of specialists looking after her and they still don't know all of her diagnoses like she really is a she really she literally is a medical mystery test case. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But I'm glad she's got it. And I'm glad we've got it. And in two weeks, we'll both be fully, uh, not fully immune, but the, the maximum immunity, I guess, is the way to put it. Although I was reading in the paper today. I don't want to get too much into this stuff, but I was reading the paper today. Things you can do now that you're vaccinated. And it's like, well, you could go to a restaurant. Yes. And you could have people over who are vaccinated, but don't, but continue to wear your masks if you go out to public areas. And I'm like, am I vaccinated or am I not vaccinated? Because if I have to keep like wearing masks and not being in crowds and well, when can we do that stuff? Like, when are we going to be able to go back to, is it just because we haven't reached herd immunity yet where we don't have enough people vaccinated yet? I'm I'm very unclear on this and I'm a little, I'm a little concerned <laughs> about the timeline that some of these epidemiologists are laying out compared to, thankfully, what some of the politicians are saying something a little less uh, strict. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to later this year and seeing how things are, are going to be. Well, uh, I think right now we're at like... Twenty percent of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated. I think we've, we're past or, a quarter. Or thirty. Yeah, we've passed a quarter. At least. Yeah, but and, and then and then like in the next couple of weeks we should be up even higher because all the people who've they said received... June one will probably hit maximum immun- immunizations. I think was so within the within a month they expect to have reached everyone who is going to get one. Really, wow. Ad- adults, not children. Right. Uh, that's what they keep saying. That's what the president says. We'll see. And all the all the politicians say it. I mean, that's a lot of people. I mean, we we've, we've got twenty five percent over the course of four months, and now we're going to get the other seventy five percent in a month. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's a whole nother. That's a whole nother discussion, I suppose. But yeah, well, well. well but if you look at the actually, you look at the people, the numbers of people who've got one shot and are waiting for two it actually is a really big number compared to the number of people who have two shots already 
like the number of people who are who are in the middle of the two shot regimen. So, right. So thirty twenty more than twenty five percent have fully vaccinated, but what's the percentage of partially vaccinated? As I recall, it was like wow, that's a lot of people who will be like flipping over to fully vaccinated when the the next two week cycle is up, like because it's every two weeks you you get right that, those people turning over. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, and look at the NPR uh fully vaccinated versus one at least one dose and so yeah like in the northeast like massachusetts is 42 percent have one dose 24 percent have are fully so right. at so, least so, one dose so, so in two weeks that would be 42 percent of the population would have received two doses okay presumably yeah. I, mean, I mean that's that's actually it's almost double that's in massachusetts right just in massachusetts but like if you look across the country i think the numbers are fairly similar Everywhere, like no, Louisiana is like ninety twenty nine percent one at least one dose. Um, Mississippi is pretty low. Yeah, Georgia. There, there's a better site that ranks all the states yeah. by. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, yeah, it's a whole other thing. Well, come on, the South, get it, get with it. Let's get some vaccines out there. Get to your local vaccination center. And let's get this over with. <laughs> the rest of us are waiting for you. Anyway, don't want to get into it. Let's move on to uh, talking about food. Now, given that you were down for the count for a few days, uh, we food, got takeout food. Chinese and then we did frozen foods from the freezer, like frozen pizzas uh, another night. Uh, and I did, some, I did some grilling. I grilled some steak and we grilled chicken shawarma one night. This, this has not been a week where we've done much cooking. Yeah, we haven't done much interest in cooking. There's a lot of stuff we've talked about before. We did fish one night. But I wanted to talk about the Easter problem, which is, what do you do with leftover lamb? Now, this is this is a, a, a thing that I encounter, because there's only a handful of things you can do with the leftover lamb that I've run into before. So you Shepherd's could, pie. You can make shepherd's pie. I always confuse that with cottage pie. Cottage pie is beef. Shepherd's pie is lamb, right? Yes. Okay. Sh- shepherd, because shepherds raise lambs. Oh, because lambs are sheep when they get old. Yeah. Nice. And cows grow into cots <laughs> or <laughs> something. <laughs> cottagers have cows? Do they? Do cottagers have cows? I guess so. They're sta- never mind. So cottage shepherd's pie. Uh, you could make lamb stew, which uh, there's a, there's, a, there's an With actually leftover lamb. I mean, you could kind of. You could kind of. We you know wing it a little bit, uh, but yeah, I could I could think of a way to do it with with it and um, leftover lamb. It wouldn't be as good as from scratch, but uh, it's a way to use it up. You could save it for pasties, yeah, which you've done before, which I've done. And Although I have to say those were, those were less less uh, popular popular. Thank you than the um, like pulled pork pasties. Yes, the pulled pork pasties were good, and they're fun, more fun to say pulled pork pasty. Uh, but sure, <laughs> I found one way that w- was really good. Whereas I took some of it, I chopped it up, and threw it in a frying pan with some shawarma spice. We're really into shawarma lately. Shawarma spices. Heated it up in the pan with that. Take a like a, either a tortilla or a pita uh, wrap. Put we, some. We had tortillas on hand. Yeah, I had you... flour tortillas. So uh, pu- I put some of the Japanese kewpie mayonnaise which I really have come to really like some of the pickled onions from our homemade pickles and some lettuce and put the lamb on that and made a wrap out of it. And Oh my gosh, that was good. It was almost as good as gyros. Yes. Yeah. Like it just, it was just leftover grilled lamb. Uh, by the way, the Japanese mayo, you know what makes that different? It's there's miso in it among other things. Really? Yeah. So it's mayonnaise, but it has a, added, added uh, Japanese food. It's miso and, I want to say like Benito Flake, but maybe. I don't know about that. I forget. What the, I forget what the other thing is. I, d- I know this definitely said it was miso. Um, now I'm gonna have to. M- I, I I took a page out of your book and and made that for Sophie and I for brec- for breakfast for lunch lunch one day. And Sophie was a big fan. She had two. Yeah, it is two lamb wraps. It's really good. Uh, I would try that with even like leftover chicken, leftover steak. That would be. Uh, a nice, a nice uh, wraps. Yeah, I need, to, I need to keep wraps in mind for when Sophie's on the prowl for food. I tried it with the those uh, pita bread that I bought on Wednesday at the grocery store. 
It wasn't the, the that pita wasn't as good actually. I think the tortillas are actually a little better for using as wraps. I did heat up the tortilla in the pan, you know. So yeah. after the the lamb was done cooking, I threw the to, the tortilla in there to kind of warm it up and make it um, um, <sighs> more pliable. More pliable. Thank you for the word. By the way, the other thing in the kewpie besides miso is rice vinegar instead of distilled vinegar. Okay, that would give it a slightly different flavor. Yeah, a little sweeter bit flavor. Yeah, I think it is sweeter. I really liked it. I, I mean, it this like, I gotta say, it was really good. And uh, I get the Kewpie mayonnaise on Amazon. You can get it for, you yeah. know, cheap on Amazon. Um, so uh, definitely. Uh, all right. So that's that's food. That's what we're talking about. Food. Yes. Let's talk about what we're reading or watching. Can I talk about two things I've watched? I suppose because you've got a, you've got quite a list. So let me go with my list first. Okay. So the. NBC TV series, I think it's NBC. I forget what it is. The TV series Manifest started its third season this past week. <laughs> like TV series used to premiere in September. That was a, t- a TV series. It starts in September. Now they start, you know, when the moon rises under the house of Nod. You know, I mean, it's just well, like. Well, yeah, the internet has basically made the whole idea of seasons just irrelevant. Right. So Manifest season three started. And uh, if in case you're not familiar with it, so Manifest is a show where the the premise is there's this airline flight coming from Jamaica to New York. And in the middle of the flight, it, it encounters turbulence. Uh, and then when they, you know, really bad turbulence. And then when they land in New York, there's a hullabaloo because it turns out they've been missing for something like five years. For okay. them, no time has passed. So they're all five years or three something years, whatever. I think it's three something years younger or no, it's like five years younger than everybody they left. And like you had families that were on different flights that got separated and and they're trying to figure out why. And then the people start getting these mysterious visions and auditory hallucinations they call them callings where they are compelled to find people and help them so people who are on the flight people who are on the flight have these experiences where they have uh visions or they see people in trouble uh, there's this one boy who's who seems to have the most ex- most vivid of these and there's all of this mystical, like, is it God? Is it aliens? Is it another dimension? So on and so forth. And the, the, it really centers around this one family, this 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 mother, uh, mother, husband, uh, mother, father, two kids. There was twins, and one of the twins was on the flight, and one of them wasn't. So the one twin is five years older than her brother. You, you got to do that when you've got you have time slip. Right. It's- and then the uh, the sister of the dad, she's actually a New York City cop, and so on and so forth. And then they, over the past couple seasons, they've encountered they've there've been more mysteries and people who weren't on the flight who've experienced similar things, time slippage, and so on and so forth. And now the third season has begun, so it's interesting. There's there are faith elements, you know. The, the verse Romans eight twenty eight keeps coming up. Um, which is Romans eight twenty eight. Oh, I knew you were going to ask me. I should have looked it up because the flight was it up. Yeah, the the flight was flight eight eight two eight. Okay. So in the so, so kind of relevant. Yes. Uh oh right. We all we know all things. We know that God works all things together. Um, for those who love him, uh, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Okay, so there's a, there's the sense of calling there, right. and that things work for a purpose for like, a good for right. a good. Right. And now the, the, you know, the people involved, they, there's been like, so what happens in the world? So some people say are, are like, oh, it's it's a miracle. Other people are like, no, it's it's a horrible government conspiracy. Oh, we should worship them like gods. Uh, really? Yeah. Or or like, yeah, like one guy becomes a cult leader. One of the passengers on the flight. I, a, I suppose I can see sort of a cult sort of thing. Going yeah. On. Yeah, and, and so you have these different reactions. Some people want to be left alone. Some people just dis- descend into self-destructive behavior. Other people just seeking answers, so on and so forth. And it's it's interesting. Um, so like I said, there are faith elements. Uh, one girl who's from a very... The, the, so the first episode of the season, this girl is from a very religious family, and um, they don't react well to it. I don't want to spoil it, but... okay. Yeah, they they and it, it's a little unfortunate because oh, ultra religious people who are you know 
they are outwardly very holy, but you know, but in but in reality, they're very intolerant or you know, sort of thing. I was like, eh, well, that's a bummer. It wasn't oh, it wasn't super heavy handed, uh, because there are other faith elements in it that they do treat well. So it's kind of interesting. Um, it's okay. It's not like the best thing. It's not like Lost. Lost was really good. Was 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 at a level above this. Do you think that they're trying to be Lost? There's totally a Lost feel to some of this. There's a there's 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 a secret that they're trying to uncover the, you know, why is this happening? This, you know, there's something, there's a meaning to this. There's a reason that we're going to, un- they're promising to uncover for us, which they better uncover at some point. But yeah, um, the, the big season uh, cliffhanger from the last season was, uh, you know, now it's been six years since the flight took off and more than a year since the flight crashed, since the flight returned. And then these Cuban fishermen are in the Caribbean and pull up the tail fin from the plane that's been underwater all this time. So how could that happen, right? So yeah, I have my theories, but uh, it's it's interesting. So yeah, Manifest season three. Father Andrew and I are both watching it, and he's a super fan. I, I'm I'm enjoying it. We were trying to get enough people together to do an episode of Secrets of Movies and TV show. Uh huh. To talk about, but we couldn't get a third, so we really need three people to do uh, the discussion. All right, so the other thing I want to talk about was Falcon and Winter Soldier. Okay, do I have to close my ears and like hum like la 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 la? la I haven't heard because I haven't watched it yet. I will speak in general terms. Okay, no spoilers. I will not spoil it. Okay, okay. so a the name. If you're of a certain age, you're gonna constantly call it Falcon and the Snowman <laughs> instead of Falcon and the Winter Soldier <laughs> because it was that movie from the '80s. Do you think that's do you think they did that deliberately? I don't know. It, it seems like a deep cut, but there's, it was Sean Penn and oh, Timothy Hutton, maybe? I have no idea. I think Timothy Hutton. The, the name rings a bell, but I don't yeah. know anything about it. Uh, he was, he was the, yeah, he was big in the 80s movies. Um, it was the movie my, when my, my parents were divorced, my dad would, you know, take me out on certain weekends and take me to the movies sometimes. And he took me to this movie. It was like an R-rated movie. I was like 12 or 13. And it's like this violent, like he didn't know. He wasn't paying attention. Uh, yeah. So it was about, yeah. I don't, who cares what that was about? Falcon and the Snowman. I keep calling it. Anyways, Falcon and Winter Soldier. It, it, snow, winter. I mean, it's really weird. So um, it's what I like. It. So at first it feels like, oh, this kind of drags. It's kind of slow. It's kind of downbeat. But it really is an interesting examination of what it means to be a hero. And the the reality of the effects of hero of of what the heroes and the villains do and the people in the peripheries. Remember when we watched um the Netflix Marvel shows, the Jessica Jones and Daredevil right. and uh Luke Cage, and they were all about they took place in New York City in the aftermath of the big battle in Avengers. And Kind of, you kind of get a little bit of the sense of the world that suffered because of these big battles that superheroes are going on. You know, there's a there's a world that's being that exists here that's affected by it, and so there's a little bit of that from this from the hero perspective. And these are sort of not they're not Iron Man, they're not Thor, they're not Captain America or Steve Rogers. You know, it's Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, and it's Falcon, you know, and it's like, how do they deal with the being heroes or being in this air realm? And this it's a very interesting examination of that and and uh, responsibilities. And so so far, pretty good. I think three we're three or four episodes in, and it's been pretty good so far. So uh, that's what I've been watching. I'm still working on my Star Wars book that I've been reading. It's uh, it's slow going actually. It's slower than I thought than they usually are. But uh, how about you? I well. Like we said, I was was recuperating and therefore kind of out of commission for a couple of days. And that was on top of already sort of on holiday mode because the kids have been taking a school vacation for the last two weeks. So I've been sort of using that as extra free time to catch up on my uh, movie watching in the evenings rather than, you know, doing school prep or just collapsing because of school. Uh, so I've been binging Marvel movies, and I'm trying to remember what the last one I talked about was. Oh, uh, uh, I think we talked about Iron Man and yeah. the first Avengers movie. Right. So I, f- I finished the entire Iron Man trilogy because after I watched Iron Man 3, I realized that I wasn't sure which one I had seen, Iron Man 1 or 2. 
And I went back and I watched two and I said, oh, I, I definitely hadn't seen this one before. And then I went back and watched one and I realized I hadn't seen it before either. So actually, I watched the entire trilogy backwards. <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> you <know>. Brilliant. <laughs> It's so funny. So what did you think of Mickey Rourke in Iron Man 2? What? Mickey Rourke. He was the crazy Russian guy. I did not notice that it was Mickey Rourke. <laughs> Mickey Rourke has undergone a transformation, let me tell you, over the past 30 years. I I had no idea. I wasn't paying that much attention. Yeah. Okay. He, 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 it looks now, bizarre. mind you, I'm watching these, like, after the kids are in bed, so after, like, 9.30 p.m. So I am not, like the most acute <laughs> you're not even you have the time you're not even looking at the screen because you're looking at your phone playing threes or something yeah i i fidget while i watch movies and so you got me doing it now i found myself doing it last night <laughs> it yeah. so... if i knit or crocheted i would probably do that like my hands want to do something and i have a hard time just sitting and watching without doing something but my fidget is this stupid phone game threes, which really operates kind of like crocheting or knitting. Like it's not It's just sliding things. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of mindless anyway. Uh, so back to back to Iron Man. So I watched all three Iron Man movies. Iron Man. Iron Man. Iron no, Man. Movies. Iron Man. <laughs> I, I really liked the Iron Man series. Um, I, I really liked three. I loved the suit as sort of the visual metaphor for, Tony Stark's PTSD. I really liked the exploration of his character. That one is sort of the fulfillment of what's been going on in his story arc. Through you this. need to explicate that. Why is it a visual metaphor of his PTSD? Okay, so the suits, as, as I discovered when I finally got around to watching Iron Man 1, the suit came about because he was, being, he was a prisoner and he was being kept prisoner in a very traumatic circumstance, like having this like thing implanted in his chest which is going to like kill him if he doesn't like solve the problem and he the suit is designed to both free him from captivity but also to keep him al like it's got the arc reactor as the electromagnet keeping him alive before that they have him attached to a car battery right um so the suit is born from trauma and is sort of a constant reminder maybe unconsciously of that trauma and of all of the battles that he's gone through unprepared so every time you see the suit in iron man 3 and i saw this without having seen the first two so it was kind of more maybe clear it looks very awkward like the first time he puts on the suit is this great choreographed number and he's like being very dramatic with the music and he's like posing and then the suit comes flying at him in first one piece and it's a little bit awkward but he manages to catch the, the gauntlet and then the, the leg thing and he's looking kind of cool and then like the pieces start coming at him faster and faster and faster and each time one hits him it's like he's being punched like he's in a battle with the suit and I mean, and then and you get like the groin piece, which comes like flying at him. And I'm sure every man in the audience cringed we, at we that all moment, cringed, yes. right? And and then, you know, the face piece comes flying at him. And, and then if, if it, the pieces like go flying and start hitting things and breaking the, the cases that are containing the other suits. And it's it's very violent. And every time this 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 suit comes flying at him, it's like it's attacking him. He's being attacked by the suit. Which is. I mean, that's very interesting. Like, visually, the suit is, is protecting him, but it's also attacking him. And then it fails him, and he's left stranded in the middle of nowhere, dragging the suit behind him. Right. Like this it's, it's, lifeless, inert thing, which he is dragging through the It's a dead weight, hole. like it's, a ball and chain. Right. And throughout, the, so, so the suit is attacking him, the suit is a dead weight, dragging him back. And then he gets to this little boy who reminds him that, who he is is not the suit. Who he is is the mechanic, the guy who invented the suit. And he goes to the hardware store and he fills up a shopping cart with all sorts of like random stuff. And then he goes and attacks the enemy's fortress with like a bunch of random stuff that he picked up at the hardware store on his credit card. You know, it's it's this great image of like him being freed from the suit. Like mm. recognizing Iron Man that isn't the suit. Iron Man is the man in the suit. Right. Like it's his brain. It's his creative ability. It's his creative problem solving tool making ability that is really the genius. And then, yeah, of course, the suit comes back because you got to have the suit come back. But then, of course, then the movie ends with. Well, but the suit eventually ends up becoming important for saving Pepper. 
Right. Well, that's really the great moment is when Pepper, who has been at the beginning of the movie, he actually has the suit come and meet her when she comes home from work after the end of the day. And he's got the suit sitting there giving her a drink. And it turns out he's actually hiding in the basement, operating the suit from a distance. Like he is literally keeping her at a distance and the suit is literally between the two of them. It Which, literally becomes an avatar for him. Right. Like he is not facing her face to face. He's retreated inside himself. Right. And so, but then in the end, she puts on the suit and it's what saves her and allows her to defeat the bad guys. And then. Spoilers. The, the bad guys get defeated. I know. <laughs> and then and this is, this is really spoilery, but I think it's important thematically for my discussion, which is in the end, then he destroys all the suits for Pepper in this great, beautiful, like, fireworks display. Right. Um, which is sort of this, like, moment of, like, self-sacrifice, self-sacrificial love. He is giving up the suits out of love for her. Right. I, I, I thought the Iron Man 3, just as a standalone movie, for me, worked really well. It, it was really had this great character arc, and the suit was just this wonderful thing. And there's all these points in the movie where he's, like flying through the air, holding onto the outside of the suit or the suit is flying, but awkwardly, or he's trying to shoot and the suit won't shoot or he's trying to fly and the suit won't fly. Like there's this. The battle between him and the suit. Right. There isn't a synchronicity or a synergy between him and the suit. And going back and seeing one again, you actually see a lot of that same sort of awkwardness when he's first designing the suits. Like there is this very, I, it's one of the things I find endearing about Tony Stark is that, they're not afraid to make him look awkward and clumsy and to show that the creative process is not a straight line, that it's messy, that he makes mistakes, that b things break in the process of design and creation, which I think is really great. I mean, I think that a lot of times we have this idea of the creative process as being this like beautiful thing. Like we just, we step into our workshop and then magic happens. Wave your hands. It's like a, a TikTok video where everything is sped up and uh, there, none of the mistakes are seen. <laughs> and I really liked that in Iron Man, you see Tony Stark making mistakes, like not just socially, not just in terms of his demons coming back to haunt him, but even in the creative process that it's, it's bumpy. It's messy things bro get broken like mm -hmm. a lot and not just by the bad guys but by tony himself like it's part of the process okay so we also want to talk about two other movies okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't keep everyone here all day uh, so you also watched ant-man i watched ant-man okay paul rudd what did you think of, uh, of ant-man i thought it was kind of goofy it, it was very much it felt like very much like the classic superhero like origin story I mean, it had the mad scientist and his beautiful daughter, which is such a trope. Yes. Um, it had some fun stuff. The, the ants are kind of goofy and like the whole, there's so many problems. It's like, a, it's, it's the classic goofy guy becomes a superhero. Right. And also, I mean, I grew up with like the whole Rick Moranis, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids franchise. And it really felt like a callback to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Which, of course, is the opposite, which is Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was really uh, kind of ripping off Ant-Man. Ant-Man yeah, preceded. Right, right. Yeah. But but for me, there there was definitely a lot of moments that, that felt like that. Yeah. And uh, it, I, I, honestly, it was an OK movie. It, it wasn't it wasn't great. The Wasp, Ant-Man and the Wasp is a little better. Yeah, um, it wasn't, especially it wasn't, because it's you need it you for watching the whole MCU. You need the Ant Man and the Ant Man and the Wasp in order to be, because they are key, <laughs> vital keys to what happens in the last two Avenger movies. Right, right. I, and I get that, which is yeah. why I'm trying to be completist. So I watched it, but it definitely felt like a sort of a placeholder origin story stick stick origin yeah. story here i would place it about in the middle of the pack for quality rating of of uh mcu movies but you know it was okay yeah i also watched uh so, Amer 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 Captain america civil war i had this first half of civil war right I, you haven't watched ultron yet have you yeah i watched age oh you that's okay. what i want all right I talk about age of ultron I, so I watched it once before with you, and I, like, fell asleep in the middle. Right, because you didn't know what was going on. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I sort of knew what was going on. But 
it was definitely better having watched more of the backstory movies. Like I had yeah. a better sense of what was going on. On the other hand, I still felt like there were places where I was kind of lost. Yeah, there's a lot going on. The thing with the Avenger movies is you have all of these big characters and you got to find space for all of them in the movie. And it can get a little overwhelming. It, it definitely feels like they're trying to shove an awful lot of story into well, what, what turns out to be an actually an awful lot of movie. It's very long. Yeah, there's a lot of really big fight sequences where my brain has a hard time tracking what's going on what's going on and they could have shortened some of them lots lots of big flashy booms bangs boffs bips okay james spader though is james spader not the the best he was ultron he was okay ultron was kind of funny i did not expect like james spader's characterization was not what i expected from supervillain robot i yeah. have to say and there was something kind of fresh and original that, that yeah it was it was it was good it was interesting mm-hmm. it it felt not what i exactly expected like ultron has this like edge of humor yeah. that makes him occasionally kind of likable right like you want to like him but he's evil well, and, and even therefore. starts to make a little sense at one point like he's not he's not exactly wrong about everything it's just what he the way he wants to fix things is right wrong. i mean what's sort of the classic robot intelligence not really having empathy for human flaws and foibles right it's a story i've seen before yes i I just talked about one from 1987 for or somewhere around there in uh doctor who (laughs) right i i'm thinking too of like in the diane Dwayne young wizards series there's there's a super right intelligent silicon life form that's kind of computer robot based uh that also has the sort of mm-hmm. impulse to want to fix entropy by getting rid of all life forms. So was Ultron the one where they had, there was a scene where they were all trying to uh, pick up the, the hammer, Thor's yes. hammer. Okay. That was a really funny scene. Yeah. And, and the payoff is kind of good too. There's um, a, there's a bigger payoff coming at the end. I, yeah. But. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, the, the, the Thor's hammer, the, the, when when and the, and the, Captain America it like nudges it a little, Thor looks worried. <laughs> he looks worried. Thor Thor definitely looks worried when Captain approaches the hammer. Yeah, um, which is fun. And I like the 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 sort of there's a little bit of banter going on throughout the rest of the movie. Then about like, well, like you know, could you put the hammer in an elevator? Then does that make the elevator worthy? Well, no, it's sort of a mechanical process, <laughs> but but it can't move the hammer. <laughs> I, I, that's one of my favorite things about the the MCU movies is especially the Avenger ones is that interesting interplay between these characters. It's the it's the relationships and these this fun dialogue, these fun relationship things that happen. That's what I really one of the things I really love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. So. It's uh, it's a lot to keep track of and a lot of yes. moving pieces, a lot of different characters and people and things. And... No, imagine years going by, by between these movies. Oh yeah, I, I'm much I'm I am much happier. I think watching them all close together in time because if I was watching these in real time, I would be like, hopelessly lost. Okay, unless I was watching them multiple times, and I don't have time for that. So let's hold the discussion of uh, Civil War. Yeah, yeah, until yeah. you've watched it. And then we'll and then we'll come back come back to that because so, uh, no one talk talk too long about Marvel movies. No, we don't want to dominate the conversation. Yes. Um, so um, let's move on then to talk about today is Divine Mercy Sunday. Yes, which works really well with the book that I finished this week. Yes, which was Quo Vadis. I talked about it a little bit on our Easter episode and the week before that and the week before that. <laughs> You've it's, been reading it a while. It is a five hundred and seventy page, eighty page novel, something like that. Um, it's big and it's, it's got this epic feel to it, but one of the themes that I loved about the novel, which feels appropriate for today is the theme of mercy. And so the, our protagonist is a Roman and he is very much a product of his culture and time. And he falls in love with a girl who happens to be Christian and there are moments when she despairs and she falls in love with him too. And they, they really have a genuine connection. But there are moments when both of them despair that their difference in their faith is irreconcilable. And then 
he he tries to kidnap her. He gets wounded. And instead of, you know, killing him and throwing him in the Tiber, which is what he fully expects to happen, the Christians instead take him in and nurse him and forgive him. As one would expect. I mean, we expect it, but he doesn't expect right. it. And he's really taken aback. Um, and they for also forgive the guy who betrays them to him as well. And so he's b- being nursed back to health by the woman he loves. And they have this beautiful, tender moment. Uh, he lays his head in her lap and she bends down and kisses his head. But they've also been arguing about the faith. And he finds it sort of. He finds Peter persuasive. Like, he really believes that Peter was an eyewitness, and he believes in the miracle of the resurrection. Like, he believes in the Roman gods, and he believes in divine power, and he sort of can buy that Christ is some sort of divinity. But he also recognizes that everything that the Christians stand for will completely overturn his entire world. Like, it is revolutionary, and he just doesn't think that he can close that gap, and neither does she. And so she leaves in despair and goes to turn to her priest for comfort and consolation. And she thinks, well, maybe I really should stop being the one to nurse him and I should go live somewhere else to put some distance between us and while I figure this out. And the priest is shocked and appalled and disgusted by the fact that this woman he has himself confirmed in the faith has fallen from love of Christ to love of a mere mortal. And he feels betrayed by her. And he, like, tells her that she has, you know, sinned mightily. And it's really about his personal betrayal, but he is very unmerciful and forgiving. And he reams her out in no uncertain terms, and she's left in tears, just distraught. He crushes her spirit. And then Peter and Paul walk in. And Peter says, peace be with you. What's going on here? And the priest lays in to Peter and tells him the story. And Peter says, excuse me, did you not hear about the wedding at Cana at which Jesus blessed the love between a man and a woman? And Peter goes on to explain, you know, Jesus's mercy and love and that marriage is part of God's plan, even for Christians. And the priest Crispus crumbles and he says, I have sinned against mercy. And he repents. And then Peter says to to the girl, Legia, "Um, yes, you're right. It is better for you to not see your beloved as long as there is this distance between you, as long as there's this gulf between his faith and yours, as long as he is blind to the truth, is the way Peter puts it, actually, which is beautiful. As long as he's blind to the truth, but you can pray for him and there is nothing wrong with your love. And maybe, and no, he doesn't say maybe. He says, your prayers will be effective. Your love will be restored to you. He makes her a promise that, that somehow... This is not beyond him. And Paul, Paul jumps in at this point and says, yeah, Jesus has worked with uh, worse sinners than this, than, than your beloved is. He, <laughs> Speaking of himself. Yeah. Right. And he says, you know, he, he, he fixed me. He accepted me. Miracles can happen. And so she's left with, with this beautiful hope and with this, the decision to, to separate herself, but to pray for him. And there's this, I I really loved the way the novel dramatizes this definite strain that does exist in Christianity um, of the the tendency to latch on to Christ's judgment and the his anger about sin and to reduce Christ to that judgmentalism. And then the contrast between that and Peter's message, which is a correction that no Christ is about mercy and love. Mm. And this, this character Crispus has three moments where he fails and he, he fails and sins against mercy and Peter or Paul corrects him. Three so, times, huh? Three times. It's, it's really beautiful. The second time is when Nero is burning Rome and the Christians are hiding in the catacombs and praying. And Crispus is telling them that, that they are going to be punished for their sins. And the, the day of judgment is coming and the lamb is going to come, not 
not as the merciful lamb who has spilled his blood, but as the, you know, the, the judgmental one who is going to punish them for their sins. And there will be no mercy. There will be no more mercy. And then Peter comes in and says again, peace be with you. And says, can the blood of the martyrs be like, can the one who bled for you not show mercy to you? This is not who he is. He is mercy. He is love. And Crispus again is silenced. And shortly after that, our hero is uh, fully converted and seeks baptism. Hmm. So that's sort of the moment. Like when Crispus falls again, and this time uh, Vinicius seeks baptism. Like he, his, watching Peter be merciful is that moment of conversion. Like it's the mercy that converts him. And then finally, the, Crispus's third fall is when their Christians are in the arena and they're about to be crucified. And again, he is saying, you are going to be punished. There is going to be no mercy. Your, your blood is going to be, um, you, you are going to be awakened to a resurrection, not of love and joy, but of punishment and damnation. And Paul comes and says, no, no, no. God's mercy is an infinite ocean and your sins are a drop in that, in that ocean of mercy. That's what Father Willie was saying this morning. And it, it strikes me because that's, that's one of the things that Chris, the, the, uh, St. Faustina says, too, that that idea of God's mercy is an ocean of mercy. Well, not surprising, given that the author of the novel is Polish. Well, this is what I'm wondering, because this is I mean, this novel was published in 1916, which was way before St. Faustina's. Oh, wow. Um, so St. Faustina's revelations were in general circulation, but they might have been in circulation in Poland, in Polish. No, not in 1916. Because her revelations were after that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she, she died. In the, she died in, in the, the Second World War. Yeah. So, and yet there is this this revelation of of mercy and this imagery of mercy throughout this novel, which is really beautiful. So Crispus ends up. Paul Paul, you know, tells him once again and remind and and comforts the Christians, brings them Christ's peace and a reminder of his mercy that their blood is the blood of will be joined to the blood of the lamb and Crispus ends up repenting once again for the third time mm-hmm. and then dies on the cross while using his invective against Nero, huh. <laughs> which is interesting because he doesn't exactly repent of his full invective, but he does, uh, Point it at a more appropriate target rather than at the the soon to be martyrs. He calls Nero a matricide and all sorts of like very true, but um, strongly worded, strongly wor- <laughs> strongly worded rebuke in the face of Nero's terrible, unrepentant wickedness. Hmm. Um. So yeah, it was a great. A great thing to re- revisit today on Divine Mercy Sunday to think about that image of mercy and the way the novel really dramatizes the tendency to hold on to judgment and then the need for mercy, the way that mercy corrects that human tendency to be too judgmental. Okay. Yeah. I liked Father Willie. So if we are the the uh, priest for our mass today was Father Willie Raymond, and he, in his homily, he actually talked about. Yeah, you mentioned um, our sin is a drop of a drop of water compared to the ocean of God's mercy. That was that was one of the things. Uh, but he also talked about Padre Pio. I really liked this stuff he, he said about. Padre told Pio. a couple stories about Padre Pio. One of them was about a uh, a, a U.S. Army captain in World War II who. During the uh, Anzio battles, the land, the uh, amphibious landings at Anzio, uh, he he hid in cowardice. He went to hide. Uh, he was so overwhelmed by the battle that he that he went to that he got afraid and ran and hid, and carried that burden with him of his cowardice with him into the you know into the the continuing of the war. And when they got to San Giovanni Rotundo, I I assume it's San Giovanni Rotundo. They didn't he didn't say, but I assume that's where Padre Pio was at the time. Uh, he and another officer wanted to see this famous 
Catholic priest who... Or the other officer wanted to see The him other officer. And can, tried to convince him to come along. Dragged him along. Right. right. And the guy went because of the stories of this little Capuchin friar who had the, the wounds of the stigmata and had magical powers. or You know what I mean? That sort of... He wanted to see the spectacle. And as Padre Pio was passing by the people and talking to them and blessing them, he kind of yells out at him, Hey, you know, Father, show us your wounds. And so Padre Pio stops, turns to him and looks right into him and says, show me yours first. <laughs> and it's a really amazing uh, idea of mercy that when we go to confession, we are showing our wounds to Christ. He shares his wounds with us. And this was, I think this is in relation to the, uh, St. Thomas's w seeing the wounds of Christ. Right. And so he's showing his wounds to us, saying, I, look at me, and I have these wounds, these wounds that are your wounds, in the sense, the wounds that, that are taking place in, in, you know, for you. But you show me your wounds so that I can heal them, so that I can take them on. I really love that image of this is what's really happening in confession, is we are showing Christ our wounds so that he can heal them, you know? Going to the doctor and the doctor says, OK, where does it hurt? <laughs> Show me where it hurts. Right. And it's not again, it's not that punishment for sin. It's going to the doctor so that he can heal the wounded places within you. The divine physician. Right. He's the, he's the divine physician who wants to heal us of our wounds. And he wants to bind us up and give us succor and, you know, give us a balm for the pain and all that sort of thing. That's what confession is. It's not a, it's not a reckoning in this, in what, and that's in the sense of I need to go and self-flagellate and receive my punishment. It's go and be healed. Right. Well, if you think about it too, penances are not severe punishments. You know, it it always feels to me, at least, that you know, say to our fathers and three Hail Marys. Oh, what a punishment for the things I did. Right. Is it's so little compared to what I confessed. It's, it's not a punishment. It's more just a. It's an act. It's, it's a small, it's like the small acts we have to ask of our children. Look, you know, when they do something wrong, all we ask is that you, you do something that shows your repentance. Just, it, it doesn't have to be a big deal. You don't have to make a big project out of it. Just say you're sorry. Just tell me, just tell your brother, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. Make it sound like you mean it. Give, give, give him a hug. Give him a hug. Say, I'm do, sorry. Maybe, maybe do something nice for him. You did something mean. Now go do something nice. Right. It, it's... And it doesn't even have to be, like, it doesn't have to be re repertory in the sense of, you know, you knocked over his blocks, so now stack them back up again. Just do something nice. Do something. In fact, maybe we should do more of that. Like, it, maybe it doesn't always have to be exactly connected to the act. Maybe it could be, especially as they get older, maybe it could just be, go do something nice for someone. Right. Because it creates the, the it, you know, doing the thing, going through the motions of the thing makes it real. So do create good. You, d you created evil, in a sense, little evil, sins. Now go create good. Right. And I think that's I think that's part of what penance is about in you know in in confession. So, yeah. The divine mercy. All right. Um I think that should do it. Let's wrap it up there. That was a good a good uh, discussion. We want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create raising the bets including Deacon Anthony R, Arvin G, Diane F, Christian E and Michael B. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue raising the bets in all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What did you think of our discussion? If you have any feedback, anything you'd like to share with us, you can let us know by commenting at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S. Or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media or send an email to bets at sqpn.com. And I'll put any links from our discussion in our show notes, especially a link to Quo Vadis, the book, in our show notes at sqpn.com. Remember to like Raising the Bets on the StarQuest Facebook page, retweet us on Twitter, where we're at sqpn, and leave us comments. 
Until next time, I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest.